So, hello, greetings. It's uh, Dr. Thomas Daffron here again. Um, and it's uh, the 13th of October, Sunday. It's my normal fasting day against Brexit. And uh, my weekly update on progress here at the Centre for Bromain Studies and Action, which I've set up here in France. Um, and I invite your support and, and involvement if you feel as strongly as I do that Bromain is a much more sensible idea, then please join us and, um, you know, let's, let's work on this together. But I'm a philosopher and historian, as you probably know by now, and a specialist in religious studies, comparative global philosophy, and peace studies, and, and all my training, 40 years of academic and educational training as a teacher and so on, has, has, has brought me to that considered view. Um, I respect the fact that other people have come to a different view, <clears throat> but I'm afraid I, I cannot agree with them. And I believe that uh, rational examination of the evidence of Brexit versus Bremain will always, in the end, if you pursue it fully, lead to uh, the rational conclusion that Bremain is a is 100% better option for the UK. I mean, I find it incomprehensible that people can think otherwise, um, having worked it out. Um, you know, logically, rationally, and also emotionally and, and spiritually as well. So, but I'm open to rational discourse um, and and a weighing and comparing of the arguments. So that's what the Centre for Bromain Studies is is for. Um, <clears throat> in these talks, I've been marshalling evidence slightly differently each week, and. Um, this week I want to talk about today, I want to start with October 13th, because many of my students and friends know that <clears throat> I've written a book which is called The Universal Calendar of Saints and Sages. This is quite a unique project. Um, it grew out of my work as a religious studies teacher, and my students will remember I used to always start every lesson with the saint of the day, um, whatever that day was, you know. Um, and in the Christian church, there's every day has allotted certain saints. I think there's two days that don't, which is extraordinary. <coughs> but um, the Christian church is quite good at, at having these different saints honoured. Um, and traditionally, they have a feast day on each day, which is slightly ironic because today's my fasting day. But um, so, yes, and, and in the monasteries and churches, what you would do is come together and have a little banquet. You'd raise a toast of ale or whatever to the memory of that saint. I think it's a lovely tradition, should be revived. If I was a vicar, I would have a saint's banquet, you know, once a week and invite the parish in. And, and we'd toast whichever the saint happened to be on that day, you know, every, whatever, Saturday night or something. And then even have a little dance. Why not? Because we should celebrate the lives of these great, these great teachers. Now, Christianity is full of amazing teachers. They're called saints. I slightly cavil at the, well, I question exactly the procedures whereby a saint is declared a saint. Um, there are some saints that have had an official procedure done, um, which is now supervised by a particular body in Rome, in the Vatican, which I, I know and love well. Um, and I noticed that John Henry Newman is just about to become a saint. He's a Roman Catholic divine from Birmingham and a great figure, definitely a great, um, a great thinker and a philosopher, and, and I respect his work very much. He wrote a very important book called The Grammar of Ascent, which is about faith and the language we use for faith. Um, <clears throat> you know, he, he, he definitely deserves to be in the ranks of the saints. He was probably one of the greatest English theologians of the 19th century of all faiths. He was, um, he began his life as an Anglican, like me, and ended up as a Roman Catholic, which, totally understandable. Um, you know, there were many great Catholic thinkers like Lord Acton, who's another of my intellectual heroes from the 19th century. But, um, but the proceed, and so to get to be a saint, he had to have miracles done in his name. And, and two were done in the name of uh, John Henry Newman. Somebody was cured by praying for him. Yeah, nice, you know, <laughs> because I do believe that, that after departed great souls die, they, they still take an interest in our lives here. That's the whole concept of the saint, right? They don't just drift off to heaven and forget about this world. No, they remain committed to our ongoing education as a planet. 
which is exactly as it should be. <clears throat> so look, um, and St. Columba's another, one of my favourite saints from Iona. And this week I translated a poem that was written about his life by Dalan Furgal, who was a great Druid Christian bard, who worked with Columba to make sure that the bardic orders of Ireland continued to be honoured, even though Ireland was now Christian. So the ancient pagan wisdom of the bards and Druids was still honoured, even though it was now Christianised. And uh, <clears throat> my dear departed scholar, um, P.W. Joyce, who wrote The Social History of Ancient Ireland, two volumes, you know, if you haven't discovered this book, get it. It's, it, it shows how that worked in ancient Ireland. The transition from the Druids to the Christians was seamless. The great Druids became the great bishops and saints and abbots of the Irish Gaelic Church and then went to Scotland, people like Columba. They were so devoted to learning um, as Druids, they then just absorbed the new learning that Christianity represented and they found the common ground between the Kabbalistic, esoteric, Christian mystery schools and their Druid wisdom that they already had. So... You know, when you're in love with God, if you're truly intoxicated with divine love, as people said Spinoza was, you know, you can't get enough of it. <laughs> and um, it's not like, you know, you have to like, oh my God, I only drink beer. No, if you're a serious, you know, wisdomaholic, <laughs> then you want the whole lot, whiskey, wine, whatever. Um, I use them, I use as a metaphor, my friends. Um, so look... Dallan Forgal wrote this great poem, a panegyric in honour of Columba, and it's, it's one of the masterpieces of Gaelic literature, and it's hardly ever been translated into English. I've just translated it myself for my Encyclopedia of Druid Studies. People ask me, how can you be a Druid and a Christian? I mean, you know, how can you not? <laughs> it's my only response to that. Um, people like Dallan Forgal and, and, and Columba, you know, they knew what I'm talking about. So, um, <clears throat> what I discovered in my career as a religious studies teacher is that there was a dearth of saints' books in other faiths. Where are the great saints' books of Buddhism or of Hinduism? Just to take two examples. I looked and I couldn't find any. Nobody's ever done it. Well, that's odd because there are innumerable saints in Buddhism, innumerable saints in Hinduism, the great seers and sages of those traditions. I'm in love with them all, you know, the great, from the very top range like Shankara and Ramanuja, right down to, you know, Amma and, and contemporary saints and sages in, in Hinduism now, and, and the others like Aurobindo and Gandhi, you know, who were great um, activists as well as thinkers, and Radhakrishnan, the amazing first president of India, who was a philosopher at Oxford University, where I used to teach. I, I love Radhakrishnan a great philosopher, but he, he gave it up to become president of India because, like a true philosopher, he knew that sometimes one has to take on the duties of helping stabilise the ship of state. Um, so, and Buddhism, too, has innumerable, innumerable bodhisattvas, and they have a very similar idea to Christianity. When a great bodhisattva dies, they don't just vanish and leave the planet, you know, like some weird New Age cults seem to think you do. No, they, they stick around in the noosphere to continually beam down light and wisdom and love and, and liberation from suffering energies to us humans because they've taken a vow to that end. A bodhisattva will not vacate this planet till the whole planet is freed from suffering. I took that vow, I renewed it, shall we say, in this life when I was 19, when I... When I rediscovered tantric buddhism and felt gosh this is my family you know um <clears throat> so i'm i'm afraid i'm sticking around <laughs> that's why i keep doing these weekly addresses you know i'm gonna i'm gonna keep doing this till we get the message guys um so look so anyway nobody had done a dictionary of buddhist saints hindu saints what about jewish saints you know where are, i mean amazing kabbalists seekers sages no, no, no single book I found, you know, the book of Jewish saints. And there isn't a procedure even in Judaism or Buddhism or Hinduism to actually make one an official saint. They're just, they sort of happen by osmosis because people recognize these people as great teachers. Aurobindo was never made a saint, and yet people still go and sit at his tomb in, um, in uh, Pondicherry, where I've been. It's called his Samadhi. He's, he's buried there in a seated position. 
I've sat there and meditated. Uh, in Jainism, again, there's no official saint-making mechanism, and yet these are genuine saints. I knew Acharya Tulsi, definitely a saint. I've been to his place of, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, burial, and um, I've sat in meditation there and communed with him. Having met him in the flesh, you know, this is a great saint. They're still around, my friends. <clears throat> so anyway, it fell to me to do the impossible task of compiling a dictionary which includes the saints and sages from all these traditions, not just the Christian, but also the Buddhist, the Hindu, the Sikh, the Jain, the Zoroastrian, the Baha'i, uh, you know, etc., etc. And I included a column for uh, art and humanity and science, so humanists, if you want, Picassos, people that aren't specifically in a religious box, uh, obviously a Jewish column, and a column for Shinto, um, Taoist, Confucianists, and so on. And then also for esoteric thinkers, because there are some people like occultists and, and theosophists and so on who don't easily fit into one of the other traditional boxes, but who are definitely spiritual, so they have their own column. And then there's a column for Freemasons, because I honour and acknowledge the fact there have been tremendous numbers of intellectually advanced, spiritually advanced Freemasons, people like Goethe and Schiller, who wrote The Ode to Joy, and Beethoven, and you know, so many of the great luminaries of, of the Enlightenment period um, were Freemasons, and, and I just honour them um, <clears throat> in, in this book as, as true sages. And then there's a column for women, because often the women don't bless them for some reason. The men seem to dominate the other religions, like Islam and Christianity. There aren't as many women saints and, uh, in Christian and Islamic tradition, or even Jewish, as there are men. So <clears throat> I figured to balance things up, the women need their own column. And I put all the greatest women scholars and teachers and sages that, that I know of and can think of. And of course it's a work in progress. I'll never finish this in my lifetime. I wrote to the University of Oxford Press saying, look, would you like to publish this? You know, let's have it five volumes illustrated, pictures, you know, let's have gold on the edge of the paper and so on. I'm still waiting for the green light because I think this would be worth doing. John Henry Newman used to teach at Oxford. Maybe, maybe he can put a good word up uh, for me through the heavenly channels. Um, he's in here, by the way. Oh, and the thing about the Christian column is it's not just official saints because the Christian church is split. Some, some great Christian scholars and sages are recognized by the Anglican Church, some are recognized by the Anglican and the Catholic, some are recognized by the Orthodox, the Russian, the Serbian, the you know, um, different schools of the Orthodox, then there's the Ethiopian Church, and so on. Um, and then there's the Protestants, <coughs> who kind of have their own list of great sages. The Lutherans have their own little list, and Calvinists, and so on. So what I've done is I've included in the Christian column sages and saints from the Protestant traditions, eclectically described. I've put in, I mean, you know, one of my favourites is, um, you know, the, the husband of Queen Victoria, um, Prince Albert. I mean, he was a Protestant. He was, began his life as a Lutheran. He became an Anglican. He was a lover of science, a lover of learning, and a great man. I mean, I think Prince Albert deserves to be in the Book of Saints, because although he's not officially a saint. He was actually a saint. He loved Victoria. They had uh, some amazing children. And he did more for the advancement of British science than any monarch really since King Alfred the Great. <coughs> um, he accepted playing se se second fiddle to Victoria. He was never pushing for status. Um, and he organised the Great Exhibition and he founded the Victoria and Albert Museum and, you know, and, and, and. I mean, there's loads of stuff he did that if you read it, you would agree he ought to be in here. Um, helping the advancement of learning and science and literature in Britain, um, behind the scenes. Unfortunately, he died early. Had he lived, I don't think World War I would have ever happened. Britain would have been neutral, stayed out, not gone to war against Germany. It was a completely ridiculous idea. We would have tried to mediate <coughs> the conflict between Austria and <coughs> Serbia, which is what should have happened. Russia should never have mobilised, um, you know, France should never have mobilised and so on. And if Albert had been alive, he would have just got, you know, on the telegraphs and stopped it. So anyway, he's in there. <coughs> um, and Hegel and, you know, 
others, Kropotkin and you know Tolstoy, and people that aren't recognized officially as saints, but I think they ought to be. Now, why bother? Why am I doing this? <laughs> well, A, because it has value in and of itself. It's a work that probably won't be recognized or appreciated in my lifetime. You know, Oxford University Press seem to be people by small-minded people. You know, I mean, I had some rather rude correspondence from the head of their religious studies at that time. Um, and, uh, you know, you hit a brick wall with these sort of small-minded people. <clears throat> um, and one could spend a whole lifetime waiting for their own education to, to reach a sufficient stature that they realise, gosh, this actually is quite an important project. We ought to publish this. Um, so instead I published it with my own publishing house. And I'm very happy with that. <clears throat> it's, it's just it's not in the bookshops. I'd love everyone to be able to get a copy. But, um, you know, you can, you can buy a copy and have it sent to you. So that's the project. <clears throat> and why bother is because it's a peace work. This is an ironic project to advance peace between all the religions and philosophical schools of the planet. Every great Shinto, Jewish, Hindu, Jewish, Christian, Buddhist, etc. is in there. As in, so it goes alongside with the periodic table of world's religions and philosophical traditions. Uh, all the philosophers are in here, all the great sages of pre-Socratic and you know, Hellenic and, and, and European philosophy, and <clears throat> also the Americans and, you know, all of them. Today we had Jose Rizal, who's a great um, uh, polymath from the Philippines, who I discovered when I went to give a talk at the Philippines at De La Salle University some years ago, and uh, I'd never heard of him. You know, in Britain we're not taught who's the great national hero of the Philippines. Jose Rizal was a Freemason, a Catholic, a medical doctor, a playwright, a poet, and he was like the Gandhi of the Philippines. <clears throat> he was he was working for Spanish, um, a loosening of the Spanish ties and control of the Philippines. And um, he never advocated violence, but there were people rebelling in the hills, and the Spanish colonial governors blamed him. And to make an example, they shot him. And I've been to the place where he was shot. It's like a national park, a memorial now. And they've got the footsteps in the ground where he walked on his way to his execution. A totally innocent man, an intellectual who wanted peace, but he also wanted justice for his people. And um, it's the same where Gandhi was shot. You get the same footprints where Gandhi walked. So <clears throat> we celebrated him today on the 13th of October. To me, these, these saints that are in this book, um, which I, you know, I follow just in their footsteps. I'm just like a spear carrier for them. Um, they, were, they were all universalists. You see, a true saint, Fritjof Schuon, one of the greatest Sufis, said that a true saint always prays for everything on behalf of everyone. <laughs> that's such a wonderful saying. I mean, he put it slightly different. He wrote in German anyway, but that's the thrust. You know, you... Yes, one prays for particular things at particular times for particular people, like, you know, please heal this poor woman or whatever. But a true saint is always thinking about the universal, the everything, and, and is always trying to pray on behalf of everyone, you know, to download that universal energy into every particular. That's what Shuan said. He's one of the greatest philosophers of Islam in the 20th century, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> and he's in the book, of course. Um, so how do we, how do we get that, that level of wisdom? This is what I've been struggling with as a teacher ever since I began teaching philosophy you know, years ago, lecturing at the University of London. I think I started in the early 90s after my degree and when I'd started my PhD and you know, wanted to make a living, so I was teaching. Um, <clears throat> And I was trying to, you know, how can you teach this, the, the kind of level of wisdom that we need on this planet for peace? Well, I've developed different strategies. Um, and one way is, is, is by working with the lineages of enlightenment. <clears throat> so I call these the enlightenment lineages. I then published a book some years later. I gave a lecture on enlightenments, plural. How can we correlate enlightenments across traditions? Like, is a Shinto sage, who's, there are many in here, unbelievably wise Japanese sages, 
They've studied Taoism, the Kojiki, the Shinto scriptures. They've studied Japanese words down to their roots. They've studied Chinese. They've studied um, Confucianism. They've usually studied also Buddhism. They're polymaths in their own context. And they've then broken through to a universal place where they're also still faithful to their Shinto Japanese roots. And they say, yes, I'm, I'm all these things, and I'm also still a Shinto. Well, what does Shinto mean? It means simply the way of the Tao. The, the, the Tao of the gods, the Shen, the Shen as the divine, the Tao as the way. So the way of the divine, well, following the way of the divine is something we all do. I mean, I happen to be a Druid, uh, as well as a Christian, as I've said, but it's still the same path. If I'm a Druid, I'm also a Shen Tao, a follower of the way. And in fact, if you look into the origins of Japanese Shinto religion, you come to the realisation that it goes back to common roots, ultimately, with the whole Eurasian tradition, uh, prehistoric shamanism, uh, where we all descend from. So... <clears throat> So how to get that level of universality across? Um, my concern about Brexit, and I'm speaking as a philosopher and intellectual, has always been that it's a, a narrowing down of our intellectual aspirations and achievements. And it's a turning back on, on the beauty of our country, the United Kingdom, which is a miraculous country. It's tiny, like Japan. But it had this wonderful blend of, of Irish, Welsh, Scottish... English, Cornish, and then all kinds of new immigrant, Jewish, Islamic, Pakistani, you know, all the, all the many nations of the world. And then the wonderful Europeans that have come to live with us, Polish and Lithuanian and German and, you know, Italian and all. I mean, I lived in London for many years. I'm still kind of a Londoner. And my parents, are, my father was born there and, and my parents are married there and, my degree is from the University of London. I started teaching in London. It's such a cosmopolitan city because it's a universalist city. It has microcosmically all the religions of the planet there. Um, <clears throat> and that's what always makes it such an exciting place to live and teach in. Are we to dumb all that down and say, no, we're English? You know, people are now saying they're going to like export, uh, throw out the Europeans among us. I mean, to me, this is utterly scandalous. And it's, it's a complete um, attack on the very thing that makes London and England and Britain such an exciting place to live and work. Um, you know, the greats of English literature, Chaucer and the whole litany, were all internationalists. They spent time in France, particularly in France, their neighbouring country, where they learned French and they studied Latin. Latin was their language, common language. And they learned Italian, they studied. You know, Shakespeare is another example of an internationalist who brought the riches of European thought into English literature. Um, John Dee, another of my intellectual heroes, was typical. He was a pan-European thinker. So was Francis Bacon, another of my heroes. So the greats of English thought have always been Europeans and internationalists. And I celebrate them. <clears throat> They're all in the book. <laughs> And I, I was working on this book years and years and years before Brexit was ever dreamed up as a concept. And, you know, if I'd have known it was coming up, I would have <clears throat> probably been more active politically. You know, I would have been, a, uh, I don't know, you know, I would, have, I would have done my bit for the statesmanship that's needed to hold the line of a tolerant, open, loving and compassionate society. So um, I'm trying to make up for lost time. But, you know, forgive me, I was doing very advanced interfaith, interphilosophical scholarship, which I'm now trying to share with my colleagues. Um, the, the, the nub of it is that the universalist tradition of every country and every culture, which you'll find in the Book of Saints and Sages, is always the peace-loving one, the outward one, the, the universalist one, the one that loves education and knowledge. Now, in every culture, there's a counter-movement, which is always a racist, xenophobic, sophiophobic um, lineage, which is usually, always, ends up being violent. And in every tradition, you've had these saints being persecuted. 
killed, martyred, tortured, buried alive, you know, everything you can think of has been done to them. Poor old Marnie was flayed alive by the Persian court that got him. Um, you know, Confucian scholars were buried alive with their books, 200 and more of them, by the Chinese emperor who was cracking down on knowledge. Um, <clears throat> Sufis have been, you know, periodically persecuted and attacked. They still are in some parts of the world. In Saudi Arabia, you can't, you know, admit you're a Sufi. You're called a heretic. I mean, for God's sake, the heretics are the sages and saints of history. It's the other guys that are the real demonic forces. <sighs> okay. So, um, that's what Brexit is about to me. It's that universalism, that wisdom lineage of, of authentic liberalism and, and, you know, the concerns itself with the all on behalf of the all that is now being threatened by this narrow-minded, xenophobic English nationalism, which has been foisted, artificially yeasted, by fake news, uh, anti-European ignorance, the kind of, you know, um, sort of stupidity that we see in the tabloids, that the <clears throat> which has now been adopted as a tone by, sadly, even some intelligent papers like The Telegraph and, and others that used to have some interesting journalists in them. Boris Johnson and co. just polluted the whole thing with their, their narrow-minded, oversimplistic discourse. The Conservative Party used to be a beacon for some intellectuals. You know, if you look back at some of the great thinkers who've been associated with it, they wouldn't be seen dead in it now under this current mafia who are anti-European. The Conservative movement's never been an anti-European thing. It's always been pan-European. Wellington didn't, didn't win Waterloo because, you know, he, he uh, hated Europeans. He won it because he loved Europe. But he had a different view of it, as did the British at the time, than Napoleon, who wanted a kind of French-run dictatorship uh, run by their secret police. Napoleon was a great lover of secret police. <laughs> and... Um, no, the, the, the Prussians and the Russians and the British came together and won Waterloo because they said, no, we want an open Europe. We want a different kind of Europe. We want a Europe with constitutional monarchy and democracy, you know, in, in balance and harmony, not, uh, you know, where people's rights and duties are, are mutually co-determining, not, you know, not a militarised Europe in which, um, you know, canon is going to decide what's right and wrong, which was Napoleon's vision. But certainly it wasn't anti-European, and um, he wouldn't have won without <laughs> the Prussians turning up in the nick of time. Wellington was about to lose the Battle of Waterloo. We owe it to the Germans who turned up. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so, so really, um, this, this, this tabloid Brexit nightmare, I think it's been stoked. I've, I've gone into this in great detail. I think it's been largely stoked by by pseudo-American right-wing uh, neo-fascist troublemakers like Steve Bannon and his cronies and uh, Trump as part of their, you know, shouting brigade. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I revealed last week that, you know, I think they've also used some pretty underhand tactics to advance it. When the true history of this is written up, things will be discovered that um, paper trails that lead to the Pentagon and you know, the NSA and so on. I think that's outrageous. I think America itself, a country I know and love very well, has been hijacked by extreme right, dangerous forces who, um, who for some reason, think that breaking up the UK is a price worth paying for destabilising the European Union. They think in wargaming terms, you know, and um, <clears throat> they've declared war on socialism because they've inherited this Cold War Ayn Rand rhetoric that... Only, individual, uh, only individualism matters, and we should destroy the socialists, right, as a wargaming thing. And that's why people like um, Javid, the, for the Home Secretary, spouts Ayn Rand's philosophy, you know, which is based on pure egotism and the denial of any social responsibility. Obviously, it's a hyper-exaggeration. There has to be a middle way between our individual enlightenment and our social enlightenment. Um, <clears throat> <coughs> so, yeah, so how to rein in the big brother across the pond? 
love, you know, it's the only thing we have, really, um, and, and truth, and wisdom, and knowledge, and education, and the very values and ideals that the American people themselves are supposed to believe in. Thomas Jefferson believed in, Kennedy believed in, the greatest presidents believed in. Um, you know, there is a great tradition in America of, of genuine intellectuals. Are they all asleep? You know, where are they? <laughs> Do they know what's happened in their country? It's been hijacked by these dangerous right-wing forces. Um, I think the hijack goes back at least as far as 9-11, which my research has shown me definitely was, was not what it appears on the can. It wasn't, as Bush said, you know, Al-Qaeda and 19 recruits. I mean, it wasn't. We know that from purely a scientific and materials base as... Um, architects and engineers have discovered it was it was a collusion with inside help now where from i don't know i suspend judgment i've written a thousand page two volume work on that as a historian and i've launched the international commission of historical inquiry into 9-11 i'm the first qualified historian to actually take this on now <coughs> somebody's got to do it you know because it's about truth. And ultimately, as I said before, the planet is dying not from you know, an overproduction of carbon or a shortage of uh, you know, food or anything. The planet is in danger of dying through a shortage of truth. We have truth scarcity. And truth is very, very important. When I was very young and in my 20s and just starting out in the study of philosophy, I launched Philosophers for Peace with my colleague John Francis Phipps in London. And uh, we called it Philosophers for Peace, Justice and Truth. That was the, the name. We printed the leaflets. I sent them out to philosophers all over the planet. There was no internet then. And we, we you know, <clears throat> I'd figured out that we are not going to get peace on this planet until we get justice and truth. I still take the view. I still, you know, run that network of philosophers. So... <clears throat> On this day, October 13th, we celebrate, therefore, from the Book of Sages, a few philosophers. And I want to just tell you something about maybe just a couple of them that I've chosen. And then I want to reflect on Brexit through their eyes. Because what I'm trying to do each week is, is go to the, you know, the higher mind that all the sages say exists. Um, and then look at our current political problems from that perspective. And I know there are vast political problems all over the planet, and I'm sorry to keep going on about Brexit, because if you're in Brazil or Argentina or the Philippines, it might seem like a silly nonsense that you can't be bothered with. But I think it brings up archetypal issues that are relevant in every country. The same struggle that we're having in the UK is also being replicated in other countries, be it in the Middle East or wherever. And it's always this, this conflict between the universalist, the peace lover, and the particularist, the nationalist, the, the, the hater, actually. Um, okay, so who are we looking at today? Well, I want to celebrate today in the calendar of saints and sages two people in particular. And I'm going to start with a Jewish thinker. This is in the column for Jewish thinkers. And today we celebrate uh, an amazing um, uh, philosopher and, and sage uh, called Moses de Leon. Uh, he was from uh, Spain, Leon, and um, <clears throat> you know he was a real human who lived 1240 to 1305 AD. He was a very important Kabbalist, and he studied the esoteric wisdom of Judaism. Now, what does that mean? Okay, so behind me on this wall here, I have a, a poster which I brought back from a wonderful seminary where I taught in Oklahoma once, which had this in the gift shop. And it shows the tree of life, if you look at it carefully, um, starting with Keter, the, the, um, the highest chakra or the...